On the morning of July 21st, 1962, Israel awoke to their worst nightmare. Egyptian newspapers reported the successful test launch of four surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Two days later, the missiles, ten of each type, draped with the Egyptian flag, were paraded through Cairo along the Nile River. Given that the entire territory of Israel lay between Egypt to its south and Lebanon to the north, the implication was clear. The Israeli public's fears deepened when just a few weeks later it became clear that a team of German scientists had played an integral role in developing these missiles. World War II had ended only 17 years earlier and the Mossad, despite its extensive charter to monitor and protect Israel from external threats, had been caught unaware. It was a reminder of Israel's vulnerability and a serious failure for the Mossad. The German scientists developing the Egyptian missiles weren't any old team. They were some of the Nazi regime's most senior engineers. They helped build the V-1 flying bomb and the V-2 ballistic missile, which the Germans had used to destroy huge sections of Antwerp and London. The entirety of Mossad was placed onto emergency footing and tasked to identify and obtain any and all intelligence at all costs. Mossad operatives immediately began breaking into Egyptian diplomatic embassies and consulates in several European capitals to photograph the documents. Recruiting a Swiss employee of Egypt Air, who gave Mossad access to the mailbags the airline delivered to Egypt, the operatives opened and photocopied their contents. The documents showed that the project had been initiated by two German scientists that in 1954 had joined the Research Institute of Jet Propulsion Physics in Stuttgart, but feeling underutilised in post-war Germany, they approached the Egyptian regime in 1959 and offered to recruit and lead a group of scientists to develop long-range surface-to-surface rockets. In late 1961, the group relocated to Egypt and recruited 35 highly experienced German scientists and technicians to join them. They were provided laboratories, luxurious living quarters and huge salaries. Just as soon as the Mossad had gained a basic grasp of the situation, however, more bad news arrived. On August 16, 1962, a document from the Egyptian intelligence mailbags included itemization of the materials needed for the manufacture of 900 missiles. An incredible number. This sent the Mossad into near panic. The intelligence collected so far by the Mossad revealed an Achilles heel in the missile project. The guidance systems were lagging so far behind as to be borderline non-functional, which meant that the missiles could not go into mass production. As long as this was the case, Egypt would need the German scientists. Without them, the project would collapse. The plan then was to kidnap or eliminate the German scientists. But after a year of failed attempts to intimidate, kidnap or liquidate the group's members, the Mossad were making little headway. They had frightened the scientists and their families, but didn't make any of them give up their cushy, well-paid jobs. Instead, Egyptian intelligence hired the services of an expert German security officer, a former SS man by the name of Hermann Adolf Valentin, to shore up security and counterintelligence for the project. By the spring of 1963, Mossad hadn't slowed, let alone ended, the Egyptians' progress towards rockets that could violate Israel. The Mossad had to rethink its approach. Mossad operatives burglarized Egyptian embassies and the Egypt Air Office in Frankfurt no fewer than 56 times between August 1964 and December 1966. The information obtained in the break-ins, which netted some 30,000 documents up to the end of 1964 alone, were important, but far from enough. The Mossad had to recruit someone on the inside of the missile project, this critical task was assigned to a division called Junction, which would become the Mossad's most important branch responsible for bringing in the bulk of the organization's intelligence. Unfortunately though, no one had been able to work their psychology on anyone close to the Egyptian program. With the clock ticking, Junction would have to look elsewhere. By April 1964, with all of Junction's efforts to enlist one of the scientists coming to nothing, thanks to Valentin, Junction had identified a dubious character who'd sold arms and intelligence to Egypt and was close to the German scientists. But there was a small problem. He was a high-ranking Wehrmacht officer, Hitler's special operations commander, and a favourite of the Führer. He was a devoted Nazi and a member of the SS. The man's name was Otto Skorzeny. In 1960, Mossad ordered the unit that handled the hunt for German war criminals to gather as much information as possible about Skorzeny, with the goal of bringing him to justice. His file said he was an enthusiastic member of the Austrian Nazi party by the age of 23, had enlisted in 1935 to a secret SS unit in Austria, and had taken part in Kristallnacht. He rose rapidly in rank in the Waffen SS, becoming head of its special operations unit. He was parachuted into Iran to train local tribes to blow up oil pipelines serving the Allied armies, and he was also part of a plan for abducting General Dwight D. Eisenhower. 
Most famously, he was selected personally by Hitler to lead the Grand Sasso raid, which successfully extracted Benito Mussolini from the Alpine villa where he was being held prisoner. Scorzani had acquaintances within the scientists in Egypt, and the fact that he'd been a superior officer to Valentin during the war were enough to justify trying to recruit him, despite his past. Through a number of intermediaries, the Mossad established contact with Countess Ilse von Finkenstein, his wife. She would serve as the entry point. The Mossad file on the Countess said that she was a member of the aristocracy and had a varied business portfolio, including arms dealing. She and her husband had liberal ideas about their relationship and had an open marriage. This was what Mossad would exploit. In July 1964, a Mossad agent introduced himself to the Countess as an Israeli Defence Ministry employee. The agent suggested he may be interested in an investment opportunity the Countess was managing in the Bahamas. The agent chosen was known for his good looks, and this did not go unnoticed by the Countess. The ploy had worked. On the night of September 7th, the agent told the Countess that a friend of his, also from the Israeli Defence Ministry, wanted to meet her husband about a very important matter. His friend was already in Europe and waiting for a reply. Convincing the Countess wasn't difficult. Only four years before, Israel had found and liquidated Adolf Eichmann. There were powerful forces in the Jewish world which were engaged in worldwide campaigns to find and prosecute people like Skorzeny. The Mossad agent was able to offer the Countess, and by extension, her husband, a life without fear. One morning, after a long night of partying, the Countess informed the agent that her husband was ready to meet his friend that night, if possible. The meeting between Skorzeny and the two Mossad agents occurred in a hotel lobby that evening. Towards the end of the meeting, the agent pulled out a long roll of paper. On this piece of paper was a list of all those known to have taken part in the Kristallnacht. Skorzeny was familiar with the document because the accusations had been raised and discussed during the war crimes trial from which he had managed to escape from. Skorzeny asked the agent what his business was. At this point, the agent decided to come clean. He told Skorzeny that he was in the Israeli intelligence service, which did not surprise Skorzeny. Skorzeny told the agent he was definitely prepared for an exchange of views with the Mossad. Exchange of views was Skorzeny's delicate way of saying that he agreed to full and comprehensive cooperation with Israel, but Skorzeny named a price. He wanted a valid Austrian passport issued in his real name, a writ of lifetime immunity from prosecution signed by the Israeli Prime Minister, and his immediate removal from the list of wanted Nazis, as well as some money. The Mossad agreed. The Fuhrer's favourite wanted all over the world as a war criminal, had become a key agent in the most important operation waged by Israeli intelligence at the time. Skorzeny's first move was to send word to his friends among the scientists in Egypt that he was reviving a network of SS Wehrmacht veterans to build a new Germany. In other words, to establish a Fourth Reich. To prepare the ground, he would tell them, his organisation would have to gather information in secret the German scientists working for Egypt would thus be required under their Wehrmacht oaths to provide Skorzeny's phantom organisation with details of their missile research. At the same time, Skorzeny also devised a plan to get information out of the formidable security officer of Valentin. Unlike the agreement of Skorzeny, who was aware he was dealing with the Mossad man, subterfuge was used on Valentin. Skorzeny summoned Valentin to Madrid under the pretense that he was hosting a special gathering for his subordinates from the war. He put Valentin up in a luxurious hotel and presented him with his phony plan for reviving the Reich. Then he revealed that this was not his only reason for the invitation to Madrid and that he wanted him to meet a close friend and officer of the British MI6 Secret Service. The British, he said, were interested in what was going on in Egypt and he asked Valentin to help his friend. Valentin was suspicious. He questioned Skorzeny, fearing Mossad involvement. Valentin agreed to meet Skorzeny's friend but not cooperate and the meeting between the two led nowhere. Skorzeny immediately came up with another solution. His next meeting with Valentin, he told him that his friend from MI6 had reminded him that the cables he had sent close to the end of the war, in which he notified the general staff that he was promoting Valentin, had not reached them or Valentin. Valentin was so thankful to the fake MI6 officer that he agreed to cooperate with him. It was only a matter of time until the Mossad would get inside the missile project. In time, Skorzeny invited other Wehrmacht officers inside the missile project to Madrid. They attended lavish parties at his home, ate, drank and enjoyed themselves late into the night, never knowing that the Israeli government was paying for their food and drinks whilst bugging their conversations. The information provided by Skorzeny, Valentin and the scientists who came to Madrid solved most of Mossad's information problems regarding the missile program. 
It identified precisely who was involved in the project and exactly what the current status of each component was. With the intelligence from this operation, Mossad managed to crumble the missile project from the inside using a number of methods. One was sending cleverly worded threatening letters to many of the German scientists based on top grade intelligence provided by Valentin and included intimate details about each recipient. It similarly uncovered a secret Egyptian plan to recruit scores of scientists and engineers from an aviation factory in Freiburg, Germany, who were about to be dismissed. On the morning of December 9th, Shimon Peres, the defence minister, presented the intelligence of this plan to the German former defence minister, who agreed to intervene. The German minister contacted a powerful figure in the German aerospace industry to ask for his help. The plan was to offer the scientists and engineers jobs in one of his companies under good conditions as long as they promised not to help the Egyptians. The plan worked. Most of the new group never went to Egypt where the missile program urgently needed their assistance with the bulky guidance systems, a development that fatally crippled the project. The final blow came when a representative from the aerospace industry in Germany arrived in Egypt to persuade the scientists already working there to come home. One by one, they deserted the program and by July 1965, even their head engineer had returned to Germany. The German scientist affair was the first time the Mossad mobilized all its forces to stop what it perceived as an existential threat from an adversary and demonstrated just how far the fledgling state would go to protect its existence. Please like and subscribe for more content and thank you for watching.